We're going to look at the categories of food that most often cause foodborne illness. Look at some of the technological um, advances that help protect us. And um, we'll also discuss some of the toxins and pesticides, that type of thing, and look at problems associated with that. Um, we will look at the organic foods and conventional foods, the differences between those, some of the food additives and what's safe about them and what maybe is not so safe. And then we will look at food safety practices. So one thing I want to um, make sure that you understand about this particular chapter is this chapter has information in it that you can use um, for the rest of your life. Important information about how to protect yourself and your family and your loved ones uh, from foodborne illness. Because this is something that probably occurs a lot more often than probably you realize. So let's go on and, and talk about um, the issues associated with that and kind of define what we're talking about. Um, so just know that as consumers in the United States, we're pretty fortunate because we've got a food supply that is ranked among the safest in the world. And it's primarily due to um, the government regulations that manage and control that um, industry. But with this abundance of food, that we have also you have a responsibility as a consumer to make sure that you distinguish between food safety and the ones that might pose a problem or be hazardous. So the FDA that's listed here, the Food and Drug Administration, is the major agency that's charged with making sure that our food supply in the United States is safe and wholesome and sanitary and just properly labeled so that we know what we're getting. Their ongoing areas of concern are listed here. Microbial foodborne illness, the toxins in food naturally, residues that you can find in food and what that means for your health, the nutrients in food, um, the approved food additives and those that are not approved. And then we'll also, we'll, we've talked about the genetically engineered foods as well. So let's get started and go delve into this a little bit more. Um, so microbes and food safety are listed first and some people kind of brush off the threat of foodborne illness as well this is not something that's going to happen and it's not likely and you know it's, it's uh, not as much of a threat as the coronavirus or the flu but really they're misinformed so we need to make sure that we understand that foodborne illness that's caused by disease causing microbes or pathogens that poses real problems to threat and threats to our health and to our life and to those around us and some some of them do not even respond to standard drug or antibiotic therapy so we have to be really cognizant of that even normal, mild foodborne illnesses can be very lethal for somebody who maybe is sick already from a chronic disease or somebody that's malnourished. Uh, maybe a cancer patient who's got a compromised immune function. Um, somebody elderly that lives in an institution or somebody that is pregnant or very old or very young. So it is something that can be life-threatening for certain people. So we have to keep in mind that those microbes are little organisms that we can't see. And the pathogens like bacteria and viruses and other ones are the ones that are um, potentially can cause us some problems, especially if they are in your food. So... Um, Microorganisms can cause foodborne illness either by infection or intoxication. So let's kind of break that down as to what the difference is between the two. Infectious agents, um, an example of that would be salmonella, and that's listed here, or hepatitis viruses. Those are the ones that infect the tissues of the human body and multiply there. And 
cause illness in that way. And then some bacteria produce toxins, and they can be enterotoxins or neurotoxins, and those are just simply positive or poisonous chemicals that react as those bacteria multiply. So the enterotoxins can act on the mucous membranes, so that's going to be primarily your gastrointestinal tract, and the neurotoxins are poisons that are going to act on the cells of your nervous system and affect that to some great degree. There are different toxins, um, and we'll go into those a little bit. The most famous ones are Clostridium botulinum, which causes botulism, and that is often a very fatal foodborne illness, um, and it paralyzes the muscles. So it is one that we fear the most because it is the most fatal. It causes some of the symptoms that are listed here, and uh, it will quickly paralyze muscles and makes seeing and speaking and swallowing and breathing all very difficult um, and eventually impossible if they don't get immediate uh, medical attention. So it is a very, very dangerous thing um, if you get it. And it does not take very much um, to make you really, really sick. So these are just an example of some of the symptoms. Um, if you do have some kind of foodborne illness, you need to really get medical help fairly quickly. If you have bloody stools, you become di um, dehydrated from vomiting and diarrhea. Um, diarrhea that lasts more than three days can severely impair somebody's ability to stay well hydrated. Along a fever that lasts longer than 24 hours, and then a headache that follows with muscle stiffness and fever. So all those things are extremely uh, dangerous, and if you have any of those symptoms, you should definitely get to a hospital ER ASAP. Um, so a safe food supply depends on food practices on the farm or at the sea, wherever the food originates. Um, it can also occur in the processing plants. Um, when it's being transported in a truck, say the refrigeration goes out and uh, the driver doesn't notice it or he turns it off as he takes a nap, um, it also uh, can occur in the supermarkets and other institutions like hospitals or restaurants. So it can occur at multiple points along that food supply chain. It can even occur when you buy it and take it home. So um, there are some things we'll go over today to kind of give you some ideas about what um, types of thing you should focus on when you have bring food into your home. Because it is that final handling of the food by us or the people that purchase it and consume it at home that is critical in that chain of food safety too. So outbreaks occur when you have something like this in um, a lot of different ways outbreaks can occur. Commercially prepared foods are usually safe. But an outbreak of illness from that source makes the headlines because of the number of people that it can um, affect all at one time. Dairy farmers, just to give you an example, depend on pasteurization uh, to kill most of the pathogens in the milk, making it more safe to consume. And then um, we also have to worry about or have to think about um, growing food because that does involve soil and we know that soil can contain a lot of different bacterial colonies and that can contaminate food as well and then animal waste that deposits itself on um, soil can get into um, introducing pathogens into our food that um, is grown so farm workers and others uh, food handlers who are sick can also easily pass pathogens on to consumers through the way they handle the different types of foods they come in contact with. 
um, particularly those that are consumed raw. So you can think of a lot of vegetables like lettuce or cucumbers and tomatoes, those things that we consume raw. So you've got to uh, be cognizant of all of that and how that would affect your intake. In uh, 2016, so pretty recently, Congress enacted a new law, and it's called the FDA Food Safety Modernization Act, and that was in response to a lot of changes in the global food system. So it focuses a lot more on FDA's resources on preventing foodborne illnesses, but it also supports looking into those asp uh, outbreaks as they occur to try to figure out what it was that occurred and resolve or fix that problem that might have resulted in a foodborne illness. This um, legislation spelled out all the actions that we need to prevent contamination at all the different points in the global food and pet food, pet food as well, supply chains. So um, it looks at the, all the resources of the different government agencies and combines that with domestic issues as well as international issues with food industry and farmers. So um, some of the food industry controls, one of the most important ones that um, anybody in the food industry realizes or knows about is called HACCP, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point. Um, inspections of the U.S. meat producing processing plants are performed every single day by USDA inspectors to make sure that they meet government standards. And um, anybody that produces food sold in the U.S. must have a plan, a HACCP plan, to prevent that foodborne illness at their different sources. So it's a method of controlling that microbial contamination. And it really has made a difference. Like salmonella, which you can get through poultry and eggs and beef and pork, has been significantly reduced. And E. coli infection, infections from meat has dropped dramatically um, since HACCP was put into, um, implemented in those industries. But we have to remember that this is important too. Grocery safety is important. Some of the most risky foods that could potentially get bacterial contamination are the foods that are shown on this slide, that raw produce. Um, and there's a number of ways that we deal with some of that. Um, we deal with it by uh, looking at the grocery itself um, batch numbering in different types of food if we realize that there is a problem in one particular type of food then we can um, let the public know what batch that was and uh, advise them to throw out whatever that food is and then we have dating and we'll go over how they do the dates on some of the foods that you have in the um, grocery store um, the way that we wrap and seal the food also makes a difference. And then um, when you do your shopping, it's up to you to make sure that you don't pick up your frozen shrimp first and then you take an hour to two hours to go through the store. Um, and that is why a lot, of, uh, a lot of grocery stores are arranged so that their frozen sections are closest to the uh, cash registers or maybe the last um, options that you have to purchase things in the store. So they're at the ends of the store. <clears throat> so let's, let's look at the dates and see if we can kind of make some sense out of them because it is a little bit difficult to make sense out of some of those dates. Um, you do need to check the freshness dates that are printed on the food packages and make sure that you get the freshest ones, even if you have to dig back in the back. Uh, here you see sell-by, so that doesn't necessarily reflect a food's safety. It just specifies the shelf life of that food. It still might be safe for consumption after it's been handled and stored properly. Um, 
I have never seen it called a pull date, although your um, slide does say that that's a possibility. Um, you need to make sure, though, when you're buying your foods, if the package is bulging or um, leaking or punctured, don't buy it. Um, give it to the store manager. Make sure they don't put it back on the shelf um, in order to do that. The best if used by date, that specifies the last date the food will be of the highest quality. It doesn't really mean that it's not safe for consumption after that date. It just means that the quality deteriorates more rapidly after that date. And then you have the expiration date. Um, that's the last day the food should be consumed. There is an exception, though, with eggs. Um, you need to um, keep in mind that the expiration date on eggs refers to the last date they can be sold as fresh eggs. So you need to try to make sure that you purchase those eggs before that date and keep them in your original carton. Don't take them out and put them in your refrigerator separately. Keep them in that original carton in the refrigerator. And then you do need to use them within 30 days. The expiration date on the eggs just means that it can't be called fresh eggs after that date expires. And I don't guess I have to tell you, but make sure that you check your eggs before you purchase them and um, don't get the ones that are cracked already because those could be contaminated because that nature seal has been um, cracked and that might increase the risk of that egg getting contaminated. Um, Shop for frozen foods and the meats and things last just before you leave the store, and that will keep that a little bit safer for you. <clears throat> there are three requirements when you're looking at what disease-causing bacteria can do. They have to be warm, uh, so they like if it's between 40 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. They have to have moisture, and they have to have nutrients in order to keep them alive. So um, any of those things um, that go a little bit sideways, it can really make a difference in the safety of the food. So you, anything with um, like an off appearance or maybe it smells, and I think I told you uh, my class earlier about if you walk into a store and you smell the seafood and the fish, I would advise you not to buy it because fresh fish does not smell. <laughs> so if you do smell that when you go in a store, stay away from it. Get your uh, seafood from another store instead. So some things that are important, we'll go through this fight back. Um, if you look at the very top left hand, it says clean. Keep your hands and utensils and surfaces clean. So that, that means using freshly washed utensils and um, make sure that you use new towels or towels like disinfecting type wipes and wash your hands properly. Don't just rinse them. You need to use soap before and after handling all raw foods. And to reduce the number of microbes on sponges or surfaces, uh, even utensils, you can do it one of four ways. You can use a chemical like bleach, um, which will kill and poison most of those microbes. You can kill them with heat like soapy water that's above 140 degrees kills almost all harmful organisms and washes away the rest of them. You can use an automatic dishwasher, and that kind of combines both methods because it washes in very hot water, and most detergent de um, that you use would contain chlorine. Or you can use a microwave oven to kill the microbes on sponges. So you can put a wet sponge in a microwave and heat it for a minute or two until it's steaming hot. And that will destroy the microbes on that sponge. On the upper right hand corner it says separate. 
So that's important to keep raw foods um, separate, especially things like meats, eggs, seafoods. They can contain those illness-causing bacteria, so you need to make sure that you don't get any cross-contamination from those root foods. So you keep the raw foods and their juices away from those ready-to-eat foods uh, to prevent bacteria from spreading. If you use a cutting board to cut raw meat, uh, you should wash the board and the knife and your hands thoroughly with soap before handling any other food and before making um, a salad or anything like that in particular, things that you eat raw. If um, you should, um, like if you take a burger out to the grill, a raw burger on a plate, then don't put your cooked burgers back on that same plate. Either wash it or get a completely new one in order to take care of that. So we'll look at cook and chill here in um, on the next one, but I just want to impress upon you that this is where a lot of people make their mistakes um, and suffer consequences of what they might call is a stomach bug, which but which is in fact cross-contamination from bacteria that is on the foods that they eat. So it's really important to make sure that you take care and be cautious about that. So cooking and cooling foods also um, to proper, the, the proper temperatures, that reduces microbial threats as well. And different thermometers can be used to do those different jobs. So if you have thermometers and you need to keep some on hand so that you can monitor and test the doneness of meats and other hot foods and make sure that you keep foods at the proper temperature. You even need to occasionally test the temperatures of the refrigerator and the freezers that you keep the food in and use the appropriate thermometer in order to do that. And you see the danger zone here, 40 to 140 degrees. So cold foods should be held below 40 and um, hot foods should be held above 140 degrees and then you've got certain degrees that you cook that particular food to particularly meats uh, depending on um, how you want them cooked chilling um, is another important part um, and the way that you thaw foods in order to keep it um, safe. Keep in mind that um, to keep things safe you should throw, thaw the frozen meats or the poultry in the refrigerator. Don't set it out on the cabinet or uh, the counter and let it thaw um, at room temperature. That's very dangerous because they can grow microbes quite easily that way. Um, chill prepared or cooked foods if you need to chill something chill it in a shallow container not a big bowl deep bowl because if you do it in a deep bowl it takes a lot longer for it to get down below that 40 degrees and that could increase the risk of bacterial growth and then things that um on a buffet um just be sure that those things are being served and kept at the proper temperatures so uh, make sure that you you check that type of thing if you're going to, even if you're doing something at home, make sure that um, things that need to be cold, if there's a long line going through a buffet, you need to put those things on ice in order to keep it safe for everybody. They're not ever going to come back to your house if they get sick that night. So which foods are more likely to cause illness? So it's always going to be those that are high in moisture and nutrients and those that are chopped or ground in particular. But protein foods are at higher risk than, than a lot of different types of food. Um, they require some special handling. Um, people who prepare meats um, should do some basic rules. So you cook it 
all the meat and the poultry to the suggested temperatures. Don't try to uh, change those suggested temperatures on uh, different types of food. Don't cook large, dense raw meats or meatloafs in the microwave because they, they're they going to burn on the outside but not ever be quite the right temperature on the inside. Um, never prepare foods that are going to eat, be eaten raw like lettuce or tomato with the same utensils or on the same cutting board as you used when you were preparing your raw meats. So make sure that if you're fixing raw hamburgers and you patted them up on a cutting board or something along that line that you don't cut your tomatoes on the same board without washing it. And then always wash hands thoroughly after handling uh, raw meats. <clears throat> as far as ground meats go, um, you really should always cook any kind of meat that's been ground or chopped to the well done stage because leaving it medium rare or pink in the center if a ground if it's a ground patty or something like that um, it's not ever going to get to the temperature it needs to to kill E. coli and ground meats are at higher risk of that particular harmful bacteria because a burger will cook and look done on the outside but might not be on the inside Things like stuffed turkey or chicken raises a lot of concerns because the bacteria in the bird's cavity contaminates the filling and you have to get it really hot for that not to happen. So um, you have to make sure and follow those fight back principles that clean, separate, cook, and chill that we talked about in the earlier slide. It's probably better to cook raw meat or poultry or shellfish before adding it to the stuffing. And uh, do mix those wet and dry ingredients for stuffing just right before you do stuff it into the cavity. And then cook it immediately afterwards. Undercooked eggs at home. Um, counts for about 30% of salmonella infections in the U.S. So it is more dangerous to cook eggs, undercook eggs, um, whether at home or at a restaurant. Bacteria can contaminate those eggs from the intestinal tracts of the hens when they're laid, and some of them can enter the eggs themselves. Not that likely, but it can happen. Um, the reason it's not quite as likely is because the FDA is now requiring egg farmers to use special methods to control salmonella um, when they raise their chickens and as they in the areas that they keep them. As far as seafood goes, um, properly cooked fish and other seafood that's sold in the U.S. are really pretty safe from microbial threats, um, but they can Raw seafood can harbor certain pathogenic viruses or parasites or worms ugh, and other um, kind of bacteria that can cause illness from something as like just simple like stomach cramps all the way to life-threatening vomiting and diarrhea. So we need to be careful because as our populations grow more around the shorelines of the world, um, People are sometimes not as careful, and the seafood that's living there may become less safe to consume because of the contaminants that could be released into the lakes and rivers and oceans. As for sushi, I think I've kind of told you this kind of thing before, but um, even a master chef can't detect if there's a microbe in that um, fish so only kicking oh, kicking only cooking can kill all the worm eggs and bacteria and other microorganisms and if you can go eat sushi tonight after talking about this I I, I don't know what to say um, raw milk products unpasteurized raw milk is um, one of the guilty things that can cause the majority of dairy related illness outbreaks and one happened here 
in uh, Tennessee not too long ago where children were being fed unpasteurized milk and um, they got very sick as a result of that. It, it's a real risk and there's real no real advantages to drinking raw milk versus pasteurized milk. The nutrients are the same in them so it really doesn't make any difference nor does it make any sense to expose a child to such a uh, terrible illness. Foods like lettuce and um, any kind of spinach, anything you're going to eat raw like that, tomatoes, uh, berries, any of those things that grow closer to the ground or in the ground like an onion um, makes them a lot more vulnerable to bacterial contamination from the soil or even animal waste runoff. So um, you need to really wash those things very carefully and well at home to remove all the dirt and debris um, and produce some produce may need to be scrubbed because rinsing may not um, dislodge the film that E. coli makes on those uh, types of products so it's important to really wash that well raw juices and ciders also pose a problem um, those can have different types of bacteria that were introduced through um, the juice itself. And when they add a, any little bit of sugar to sweeten it, that can really increase the nutrients so that um, the bacteria can grow a little bit more quickly. And then you see sprouts. I don't know if you... Used to, we would have uh, bean sprouts on raw salad bars, but they grow in that same warm, moist, nutrient-rich conditions that microbes really like and uh, should not be eaten raw. Cooking them is the only way to safely consume sprouts in some cases. So how can we improve the quality and safety of the foods, uh, and how have we done it? So um, we've used pasteurization, which we've already talked about, but there's always some other advances in technology that we have used as well. And one of them is irradiation. That's been evaluated in extensively over the past 50 years. It's been approved in over 40 countries and by a lot of health agencies, including the World Health Organization and the American Medical Association. And it, it's a method that protects consumers. And some of the benefits are listed here. It controls the foodborne illness. It helps with preservation because it can destroy the mold spores that uh, produce different types of toxins on that type of food. It controls insects, uh, particularly those that um, are on fruit. It delays sprouting, and that can be particularly important like with potatoes because that, can, that sprouting can cause problems with potatoes. And it also sterilizes some products. Consumers are a little bit... Um, uh, not trusting of this type of um, advance, but um, it does work because it exposes food to controlled doses of gamma rays. And as they pass through cells, they disrupt DNA um, and that kills or activates the cells. So that's how it controls those microbes and gets rid of them. They've also used irradiation to delay the ripening of bananas and other types of fruit. And higher doses, which still is too low to damage the food, higher doses can even penetrate insect exoskeletons and molds and bacterial cell walls to destroy them. And it doesn't, irradiation doesn't typically sterilize most foods because the doses aren't high enough to kill all the microorganisms. And, um, in certain low doses, it doesn't 
change the taste or texture of those foods either, and it does not make the foods radioactive. Um, some vitamins are destroyed by that irradiation, but the losses are typically no worse than those from other food, um, food preservation methods like canning, for example. So people do have concerns, um, but um, they need to know that food will um, not become contaminated with radioactive particles. Um, it won't be radioactive for years, and um, it um, is intended to help or complement or not replace other food safety methods. So irradiation is used a little bit more sparingly because um, it can damage the foods, certain foods, or it might impact the vitamin nutriture of those foods. So it's not used on those foods that it might actually change or alter the quality of them. So this just lists a few other technologies. The FDA and the USDA are improving their techniques for monitoring for microbial contamination. Um, so they've got certain ways that they have done that. Um, they've got better testing than they used to have. Um, scientists, FDA scientists, actually have a mobile lab that they use, and they can check fresh produce where it's actually harvested and analyze it for many kinds of bacterial contaminations. So they can um, go in and to these farms and actually uh, test them uh, where there is questions or maybe previous problems have occurred. Um, they've got better detection methods for E. coli, um, whether that's in the water or sediment or um, other parts of the environment, and they can intervene before, before those microbes can contaminate crops. They use vacuum packaging um, as a way to reduce the oxygen inside a package and reducing the opposite, uh, the oxygen inhibits the growth of a lot of different types of microbes. They can also use high pressure um, technology to uh, increase the pressure to the point pit that it can kill a lot of types of uh, pathogens. I thought it was interesting they mentioned edible antimicrobial wraps and films. There are such things as, which I didn't know, bacteria killing food wraps and films. And this is not as common, but uh, this is something that they're still looking at and um, working on establishing these wraps or these films that they can utilize. And that's something they sometimes use on those cheese sticks. Um, like if you get those cheese sticks and you pull that film off, um, it protects the cheese stick from oxidation and bacterial growth, the type of film that they are encased in. So the FDA regulates a lot of different chemicals in food that can occur as a result of things that we do as humans. Um, there's natural toxins in foods. Many plants have those natural poisons that they have inside them in order to kind of fend off the um, enemies of that particular food. So nature's given those plants those natural poisons. And usually humans do not suffer from those poisons, but the potential does exist. And that's where I was talking to you about the potatoes, those sprouts, and then that green that you sometimes see is solanine. That's the green that forms um, kind of under the peel or with the peel of the potato. And it's not itself the green color, but it's the green color is what tells you that that solanine has formed because of the chlorophyll that it reacts with. So that's something that is considered um, a neurotoxin if you get enough of it. 
So it would probably be better if you see a potato with that green on it just to either cut it totally off or um, get you another potato. The use of pesticides also helps the survival of different food crops, but the damages that they do to the environment is considerable and even increasing. The farmers use big qualities, um, large, they lose large quantities of their crops um, to pests every year. And in general, some of the um, benefits that those pesticides do is they protect crops from insect damage and they can really increase the yield that farmers have. Um, but over time, they can accumulate in the food chain and, and have a, an effect, a negative effect on pollinators like bees. Um, they can pollute the water and the soil and the air as well. So I guess the question would be, do they, on pesticides on foods, does that pose a hazard or a problem for us as consumers? And they have done some experiments and found out that high doses of pesticides in certain lab animals, like rats, for example, cause birth defects and tumors and organ damage, um, even... Um, we know that small amounts of pesticide residues can survive processing and traces. You can often, often find that on foods that are served to people, but these amounts are thought to be causing negligible risk to most people. But those people that are vulnerable, um, you have to remember and what kind of risk it could impose on them. So particularly infants and children, because they are more immature and their detoxifying systems really can't cope with poisons. So with kids and infants, those poisons or pesticides can stay in their system a little bit longer. Um, and you have to think about kids too. If they're outside playing, where are they playing? They're playing in the dirt. So they have that exposure to soil and they have the exposure to more pesticides than an adult would have as a result. Um, so we need to be a little bit more careful with that population. So one possibility for reducing pesticides exposure is to choose more organic foods, particularly for um, kids and children and infants. Pesticides are regulated by the EPA. They have a set reference dose for the maximum residue that's allowed on the food. Um, and there is a, a limit of approval that the EPA evaluates. So, um, and they do evaluate different farms um, and it's particularly those that are having a high production of a certain food. And they have um, a point that they have ascertained by research on lab animals at what point that should not exceed to be safe. Another problem is that some insects actually get resistant to certain pesticides. So... Um, they have an ability to mutate, just like humans do, and um, they can get to where they can survive that exposure. And when they survive, when a few hardy ones, insects, survive that exposure to pesticides, then they are going to repopulate with a mutated type of strain of insect. And they don't have the competition. So uh, they can attack a crop with um, a nude, an enhanced vigor, I guess you could say. They can go crazy attacking a crop, and pesticides are not going to control them as a result. And this is just a sample of uh, some natural toxins that are available or found in different types of food. 
Um, hemlock is a very po poisonous herb, and sassafras is, and you can actually kill people with those. They're so potent. So they are not found in herbs and beverages. They have been banned. And then certain things, the cabbage family, I've told you how healthy that is. But um, some have um, compounds in them that can interfere with the thyroid and its production um, in the thyroid gland, causing it to enlarge. Um, certain other... Um, Foods can have a precursor to cyanide in it, uh, certain types of foods. And although most of them are low, some of them are, are high, apricot and cherry pits have that uh, certain type of precursor to cyanide in it. And they once were using those as a cancer cure called laetrile or vitamin B17. And... Um, that can that would actually kill people when they were trying to find a cure for an advanced stage of cats cancer. So seafood also can occasionally become contaminated with red tox red tide toxin from algae, um, and eating that can cause paralysis, which is pretty scary. I've So let's look a little bit about organics, uh, organic gardens and what that entails. And it says here that they um, these organic gardens use natural pesticides because um, they occur, pesticides can occur in nature as well as being produced in laboratory. And I guess just give you some examples, nicotine and tobacco um, is a pesticide, but it is also... Um, a problem with tobacco. Bt um, pesticide is an insecticidal uh, protein that's common in soil and um, it can sometimes or is sometimes extracted from the soil and sprayed on farm crops and in organic gardens because um, it is a natural uh, common soil bacterium that exists. So sales of organic foods have gone from uh, four billion in 1997 to 49 billion in just a couple of years ago, and we know that their price is up to 40 percent higher than other types, other regular foods, I guess we can say. But they still appeal to consumers because they think they're buying the best, the best tasting, the best. Um, nutrient-packed, chemical-free food that they could possibly buy. Um, but some of those things do differ. Organic rules, just to give you an example, <clears throat> a farmer, the manufacturer, if you say that you're going to be selling certified organic food, they have to pass USDA inspections at every step. So all the way from production uh, and the seed grown in the, in the ground through the making of the compost for the fertilizer to the labeling and manufacturing of that final product. Um, and um, it is just as important that um, all those things do occur and um, makes, makes us feel a little bit more comfortable about foods that call themselves organic. Pesticide residues, um, they're everywhere. So eating a, do a diet of just organic foods alone, it does reduce your pesticide exposure, but it does not eliminate it. And um, the typical pesticide exposure in the U.S. is 10,000 times below the level at which they have identified risk. Keep in mind, though, just as before, children are going to be more sensitive than adults to pesticides, but the risks are not zero. And a lot of people fear or worry about harm from those chemicals in any amount. As far as nutrient composition goes, there's very little nutrient difference between a conventional and organic food. And, you know, it's just very little changes, not something that you would expect um, 
to matter that much. Some organic meats can have a little bit more omega-3 fatty acids than conventional meats, but only if the animals were fed in pastures where there are wild plants. Um, and organic foods uh, could be a little bit higher in certain phytochemicals um, as a re result as you compare them to conventionally grown foods. Growers of organic foods use um, certain agricultural techniques that minimize harm to the environment. So there's some uh, environmental benefits to organic foods. Uh, farmers and ranchers who sell organic eggs or dairy products or meat, they have to um, provide their animals with a certain amount of access to the outdoors. They can't have those animals in a confined space. Um, the thing I like the best is that those animals don't, do not receive growth hormones or daily antibiotics as occurs in some other um, areas. Um, and they don't have the drugs that conventionally raised animals are given when they're overcrowded um, in conditions like overcrowded pens and uh, that type of thing. The only issues that you need to worry about is foods that could be potentially contaminated with untreated manure. Um, and they use that manure as fertilizer, or it could just be runoff from animals that are around where those foods are being grown. But that contamination could occur in organic foods and conventional foods alike. Um, we do have to worry a little bit more about organic things imported from other countries because... Um, they may not be having the same standards that organic farmers in this country have to adhere to. So I guess in the future, be sure that you buy safe, um, conventionally grown fruits and vegetables, wash them really well, and you can eat them and be confident that you're um, doing what you need to do. And if you prefer and can afford organics, then enjoy them. Um, if they feel you make you feel more comfortable, then enjoy them. But ultimately, just make sure that you choose those nutritious fruits and vegetables that you know I think we all need more of. So animals and drugs. I mentioned that a little bit earlier, and consumers often are worried that the meats and animal products they eat can be contaminated with chemicals and drugs. Um, and we know that um, there has been a pretty rapid spread of certain diseases because of drug-resistant bacteria, um, and they're not responding to any kind of antibiotic theria, uh, therapy, and that's, that's worrisome and a big threat to our uh, food system. For centuries, or half a century anyway, farmers have given livestock um, antibiotic drugs as a part of their daily regimen. And that is just kind of um, a way they do to warn off infections that are common in certain animals, particularly those that are living in crowded conditions. Um, it, and if you get, um, we know that there's a threat to humans and our life from antibiotic resistant bacteria, and we're getting exposed to those bacteria more and more on a daily basis just because we take so many antibiotics ourselves. But the fact that we might be eating foods that have antibiotics too, then um, that is a problem. Nowadays, most farmers, um, use antibiotics only when a vet uh, says they should to prevent or control or to treat a disease. And uh, they are somewhat restricted on uh, the types of um, or the meat that they can produce if that animal in particular is on those antibiotics. So there are new guidelines that they have to go by in order to do that.
Um, recumbent bovine somatotrophin is um, um, it is a injection that some cattle producers in the U.S. give their beef, and that's to help them grow more lean tissue. Um, it could also be to increase their milk production if it's a cow. So um, those types of drugs have been deemed to be safe, and um, the FDA does not require testing that food product, that dairy product, for example, for traces of it. So um, again, tests looking at conventional milk versus hormone-free milk or organic milk, there's no difference in the nutrient content, nor is there any difference in the antibiotic or bacteria content of those types of food. And then finally, arsenic is something that is a naturally occurring element um, from the earth's crust. And we think we actually require a little bit of that. But it is an infamous poison. And um, it is given sometimes in very small, minute amounts to poultry in order to kill the parasites that would um, stall their growth. So it can build up in poultry meat. Um, and that adds to the content in arsenic of our water and our soil and even in our food supply. So that's something to kind of keep um, an eye on. There are also environmental con contaminants. That's anything that is in food that doesn't really belong there. So we call that a contaminant. Some of them stay in the body for a long, only a short period of time because we are able to get rid of them or destroy them. And others stay and resist our ability to break them down. And they can interact with our system in, without being excreted. So they can have a toxic effect. Uh, and that degree just depends on how exposed or how long we've been exposed to that chemical. <clears throat> to give you an example, mercury or PCBs and other substances are often found in um, certain types of seafood. Um, mercury is especially of concern. Um, in the mid-20th century, there was like 23 babies got so ill with a strange disease. And as they looked into it a little bit more, they saw that mortality was high. And that the ones that survived the disease got blind and they became deaf and uh, resulted in severe mental and physical retardation. And they finally discovered that the manufacturing plants in the region were discharging mercury into the waters um, off the coast of Japan. And the bacteria metabolized it and turned it into a poison called methylmercury. So now the FDA, as a result of that, tells all pregnant women or people, pregnant or women who might become pregnant, and then young children not to eat certain marine fish because they might be high in methylmercury. So that's um, there's different types of fish, and they usually have a, a firmer flesh. So it's things like mackerel, uh, certain types of mahi-mahi or swordfish. Uh, tuna is also one that... Um, is at risk of having methylmercury. So let's look at, finally, we're going to look at uh, food additives. And um, I guess we just have to determine, are they safe? There's thousands of food additives in our food. And most of them are real strictly controlled. They've had a lot of studies done about them to make sure that they're safe. And there are a lot of regulations to, that manufacturers have to deal with in order to satisfy the FDA that it's an uh, additive that's needed, but yet it's also one that is safe. Um, so the manufacturer has to provide proof that it is safe, that it doesn't cause any birth defects, and that has to be based on studies with experimental animals. And then they have to go by a host of other regulations to make sure that the additive is applied safely. 
the grass list, which is on the um, right side of this slide, approved uh, additives are added to this generally recognized as safe list. And um, that changes. It's continually being updated by the FDA. And um, it is continually uh, revised. So no additives are permanently approved. But all of them are reviewed on a periodic basis as new facts come to light about those. There is a margin of safety, and um, it is the approved food additive usually has a very wide margin of safety. Um, they um, have a limit to how high that can go as far as concentration with the risk still being at zero, and that is uh, has to be approved. Most additives in food offer a lot more benefits and outweigh their potential risk. And um, color additives are one that has really recently changed. Used to, they used a lot of different color additives to enhance the appearance of food. And it really did nothing except just improve the way they looked. Um, and so uh, many of those have been discontinued as a result of that. Um, or they're using natural colors that uh, they take from other foods or fruits or vegetables, for example, in order to get a, the color that they desire. So flavoring agents, uh, non-nutritive sweeteners, that we all know what they are. They make foods taste sweet without promoting uh, dental decay or providing empty calories that you get from sugar. Um, and there is a pretty good table in your book on page 469 that really gives you a lot more detail about non-nutritive sweeteners. So just keep in mind that um, they have been looked at and evaluated and some of them have been taken off that safe additives list and some of them have been put back on once more research has been done. Um, <clears throat> aspartame, which is a really common sweetener these days is um, one of the most commonly studied food additives ever approved by the FDA and it does have some restrictions um, particularly with people that have uh, PKU or phenylketonuria because they cannot take aspartame um, in their diet as a result of that. And then we're probably all familiar with monosodium glutamate because it's used a lot in restaurants to enhance flavor of different types of food, especially Asian restaurants. And um, it has a basic kind of savory taste. Um, and um, it does, in some sensitive people, produce some adverse reactions. So um, that is something that some people have to avoid. If they're particularly sensitive, then they do have to avoid any of those types of foods. <clears throat> there are a lot of different fat replacers, and they come from carbohydrate, protein, or fat, um, and they provide just a few calories, not nearly as much as real fat does. So those protein-based replacers have a creamy feeling in the mouth, and they're most used in like ice creams and yogurts to give it that um, um, creamy feeling and, and that good taste. Um, so an artificial fat is sometimes used to make potato chips. That's called Alestra. And Alestra is one that... Um, does bind fat-soluble vitamins and chemicals and causes their excretion. It can also cause significant GI distress if uh, people eat too much of it. Um, that's one of the side effects. So consumers are often unaware that a lot of substance can get into their food during the production or the storage or packaging or just through your preparation in itself. And those are called incidental additives. and But they're really contaminants because they weren't intentionally added to those foods. And some examples are 
bits of glass or paper or metal, um, even plastic from different types of packaging, or um, they uh, your book called it unavoidable filth, like rodent hairs or insect legs and fragments, which just totally turns my stomach. But it's best just not to think about that. They're regulated, and they're not going to usually hurt you. Um, their safety is confirmed by procedures governing those same additives. So um, you just have to keep in mind that that's always a possibility. BPA is bisphenol A, and that is a compound that migrates into many different foods and beverages from plastic food cans or soft drink cans or bottle or your water bottles and they warn um, researchers warn that they have not been able to determine the hazards uh, for human beings uh, due to BPA they have eliminated uh, BPA in baby bottles and sippy cups and that type of thing because of the feared potential risk so uh, make sure that your water bottles and say that they do not contain BPA, although the FDA has not um, determined that it is unsafe. They're continuing to still do experiments to see if they can make some um, definitive decisions about BPA. Some microwavable products have um, packaging that participates in the cooking of food, so like Pizza, you can leave it on the cardboard pan um, and you can heat it up pretty hot. But keep in mind that some particles of these kinds of packaging can migrate into the foods. They've been tested for safety and de deemed that they're an incidental additive. And uh, although it may not be entirely safe, they cannot actually confirm that they are dangerous for human use so just be careful when you heat up your microwave um, only types of foods that you get so just to kind of conclude um, I don't want to scare you but because our food supply in the U.S. is really safe and hazards are pretty rare the biggest threat by far is foodborne illnesses that we get and we need to make sure that we um, are more aware of when that can occur because I think it really can occur more commonly um, when we take our food home. So a good place to start is uh, kind of take inventory of how you currently prepare food and how you currently do when you're take in like a raw vegetable and you're eating it are you just going to pick it up maybe you need to be a little bit more careful and and wash that off a little better so uh, be observant because those microbes are everywhere and they can multiply pretty fast if you give them nutrients and water and a little bit of warmth so stay alert to those danger signs and be cautious whenever and wherever you eat um, at a barbecue or a picnic, if you go out around 4th of July this year, don't be shy about checking how the raw meats are, the, um, are stored or how, they're, how long they've been sitting out there and just be real cognizant of the ones that are at, you're at higher risk for do, getting a, a bacteria or a microbe from and stay away from those. And um, take action. So if if you see that um, some place, a restaurant or um, some other place is breaking the rules for food safety, you can do one of two things. You can inform the person that's in charge, or you can tell the people that you're with of the dangers, or you can just kind of walk out yourself and... Um, protect yourself from those types of things and stick with safe foods like the breads or the intact fruit or the hard cheeses so um, just kind of stay alert so when friends gather at a restaurant and they want to enjoy some sushi um, or they're eating raw cookie dough in someone's home if you can't persuade them not to do it then you be careful about your choices as well 
Keep in mind that restaurants and cafeterias have to pass regular inspections, usually every six months, for cleanliness and making sure that they are uh, going by the food safety rules. So um, I always check what their scores are um, before I eat in a new restaurant. So just make sure that if you get food in a restaurant that's supposed to be hot, that it is really hot. And if it's supposed to be cold, that it's really cold. If it's not the temperature it's supposed to be, send it back or choose something else. So I just hope some of these little tips will keep you healthier. And keep in mind that maybe a lot of those stomach bugs that you're um, blaming your um, illness on is not that at all. Maybe it has something to do with food safety and contamination. So kind of look at what you're doing now and uh, make sure that you evaluate that so that you don't have those problems. All right, we will talk to you later in the week. Have a good rest of the day. Bye.